Okay, welcome everyone uh, to this, the uh, Royal Economic Society policy webinar. Uh, my name is Rachel Griffith, and I'm the uh, past president of the RAS. Uh, so this is the third in our series of seminars, and we have an exciting new set of seminars coming up for the next new uh, few weeks, which should be up on our uh, website either now or very shortly, and you can sign up for them. So we plan to run these approximately every week going forward. Uh, so today I'm really pleased to have uh, here with us Angus Deaton and Richard Blundell to talk about uh, inequality and both the implications it has for the way the pandemic is playing out and, and vice versa, the way the pandemic may affect inequality. Uh, so without any further ado, let me hand over to Angus, who's going to start us off. Thank you, Rachel. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, from early morning in Princeton. Um, and it's um, one of the silver linings, I guess, of this epidemic um, that we get a chance to talk about this thing um, and share some of the things that some of us have been trying to think about. Let me bring up my um, screen. Um, and um, not sure what to do here. Um, can you see that? It worked before. Um, sorry, I appear to be stuck. There, okay. Yeah, I think you can see it now. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry for the technical glitch. So like Richard, I'm going to talk about inequalities in the COVID-19 crisis. And um, yeah, okay, find out which buttons still work. So I wanted to start with some quotations, which are just to suggest that this relationship between inequalities and pandemics um, is being very deeply embedded um, in thinking for at least 150 years. Um, Rudolf Virchow, um, was a German physician um, who is famous for really understanding cells, how cells work in the body for the first time. But he's also the father of social epidemiology. And here is one of his quotes, which is that medical statistics will be our standard of measurement. We will weigh life for life and see where the dead lie thicker among the workers or among the privileged. Um, the second quote is more recent from Paul Farmer, one of the founders of Partners for Health and famous for his work on HIV AIDS. Um, and he says, inequalities have powerfully sculpted not only the distribution of infectious diseases, but also the course of the health outcomes among the afflicted. Walter Scheidel, the classicist and historian at Stanford, um, in his book, The Great Leveler, Four different kinds of violent ruptures have flattened inequality, mass mobilization warfare, transformative resolution, state failure, and lethal pandemics. And he pretty much suggests that those are the only things that can really flatten extreme inequality. And then much more recently from CBS um, 60 Minutes the other night, a situation like this, it highlights problems that already exist in society that people haven't noticed. Suddenly you see things, it's like an x-ray machine exposing societal faults. Now, just a warning, I think from now on, I'm going to put this on all my papers and presentations, that all these calculations are subject to revision. The numbers are changing on a day-to-day -day basis, and I may have gotten something wrong. When you're trying to recompute these things every day, um, bad things happen. I wanted to start with something that's easy to forget, but there's a huge central inequality here between the people who die and the people who live. Um, and people will often say it's so unfair that he died or she died. Um, and so that inequality is, is pretty important in this situation. So if we look at the groups, obviously the old are dying more than the young. Um, men are dying more than women. Um, the sick more than the healthy. Um, pre-existing conditions, particularly obesity, diabetes, and heart disease, um, um, make you more likely to die of this. 
the additional risk is close to proportional to pre-existing risk. So it's like you had a risk coming into this epidemic and then there's an additional risk and that additional risk is sort of proportioned to the baseline risk. So you could think of that as being sort of fair, right? The inequalities that were there before are just magnified a little bit. And if so, you can think of this as just bringing death forward um, with maybe modest effects on life expectancy, at least over a few years. But there's another attitude to this, which is that these inequalities were unfair in the first place. Um, I've heard people argue, I'm not sure I would argue it, that it's unjust that men die earlier than women. And COVID is making that inequality worse. I think there'd be much wider agreement that if disabilities um, penalize people, then that makes it even worse. Disability is punished even more. I wanted to also think about the familiar income and wealth inequality. You know, it's possible for the rich to hoard all the wealth or all the income. Um, so you can imagine a society in which the rich have everything, and you can also imagine one where the poor die of hunger while the rich are well fed and living in their castles or other diseases. This infectious disease are different here, partly because the rich cannot really isolate themselves forever. It's not impossible. You can climb into your castle or put a gate around your city, wall around your city, though once the virus gets in, you're toast. Um, cities have historically segregated by race to avoid disease, and much horrors have happened in that name. But societies and countries today are very interconnected, so it makes it very hard to avoid infection. So you can't really be a rich person without the infection and a poor person with it. So this cuts across vaccine versus drugs. The key thing about a vaccine here is if it's going to work, it needs to cover basically everyone to be effective. That means not just within the countries, but across countries. Whereas a drug, on the other hand, if it was really effective, the rich could have this very expensive drug and prevent them from getting sick while the poor suffer. You could imagine that happening. So there's a distinction, as is often the case, between vaccine and drugs. There's a theory in social epidemiology called the fundamental causes theory of health inequality. And let me lay that out quickly. In the initial stages of a disease, it can affect sort of anyone, rich, poor, or both, geography, whatever. It depends on where it came from, how it came, the nature of the disease. Now for COVID-19, it seems like in the first days, global elites and traders were the ones who were most affected. That's been true for many earlier plagues, including the Black Death, not for cholera, incidentally. Cigarette smoking used to be more common among elites because it cost more and doctors were more likely to die of lung cancer than patients, but no one really knew why. In England for about 400 years, and that's simply because we couldn't go back earlier than that, aristocrats and commoners had pretty much the same life expectancy in spite of successive waves of disease, smallpox, um, plague, and so on. So what fundamental cause theory says is that inequalities open up only when the means to control exists. So that wealth and power can be used, otherwise not. If no one's knowing what causing the disease it doesn't help to be very smart or wealthy or powerful. Um, but when a cure comes into sight, often the rich, better educated, higher social economic status can use it better. Now for smallpox, that took centuries. For COVID-19, it was almost immediate. We knew what it was. We knew why it was killing people, even in contrast to 1918-19, where people didn't know what it is they were dying of. This makes a very, very important point. It's the social distancing or other remedies that cause the inequality. It's not the virus that makes inequality. It's behavior and social structures, not biology. So it's these pre-existing social structures, the pre-existing inequalities, the structure of society, that determines who lives and who dies. It's a very important point. Um, I want to talk a little about education and death in the US today. So Anne Case and I have just published a book called Deaths of Despair and the Future of Capitalism. And I want to just mention how that feeds into this. So what we call deaths of despair, which are suicides, overdoses, and alcoholic liver disease, have risen rapidly in the US for those without a BA. This is educationally structured. 
since 1995. Almost exclusively has the rise been among those without a VA. There were 158,000 deaths of despair in 2018. Of course, there's some people kill themselves or overdose in a normal year. So it's maybe about 100,000 excess deaths per year over normal. So the COVID-19 projections for the United States today are around 70,000, um, maybe a little more than that. It's been a little less now going up. Um, some of those people would have died fairly soon anyway. So mortality in 2021 could be reduced, though there may, of course, be a second wave. But if you look at deaths of despair, there's been 100,000 deaths of despair a year for as far as we can see into the future. Um, in 2018, overdoses fell a little bit, though we don't know what COVID is doing to people with addictions. Um, suicides are rising and likely to increase because of isolation. And again, let me make this basic point, these excess deaths are almost entirely among those without a four-year college degree. They're socially structured. So social distancing further widens the gap between those with and without a VA. So just think of the fork here. Without a VA, you're more likely to be a manual worker. You're either essential or non-essential. The, non the essential people risk their lives, health personnel, bus or subway drivers, elderly, elderly care attendants, food retail, delivery. The latter, the non-essential ones, lose their livelihoods or risk their livelihoods. These are people in non-food retail services, restaurants, etc. So you got this fork. I mean, you either lose your life or risk losing your life or risk losing your, um, your income. Now, Chai Wei Chu and Rob Joyce at IFS have documented this for the UK, and I haven't done that here yet, but it's almost certainly very similar um, here as to the occupational, the sex, the age split of those people. But once again, it's education that puts you into that class or lack of it. Um, the US is now talking about opening up and some states are doing so already. If your employer opens up and you decide not to come to work because you're scared and you think you're gonna die, you lose your unemployment benefits. So you now have for each individual, the choice between their money or their life as it will. The educated elite stay at home, go on working, they stay safe and get paid, and they give webinars like we're doing right now. Um, so if you think about this in terms of traditional inequalities, this will almost certainly widen the earnings premium for VA, which is currently at 80% in the US, as well as widening the mortality differentials between those without a VA and VA, which are widening already. Um, just as a second point, and I think you're going to hear about this in a week or so, that um, electronic learning doesn't seem to work so well for kids of less educated parents. So this is opening up educational divides, which will last be with us for many years. I wanted to talk a little about political inequalities and death, which I find very striking. In the US, we have 50 states, 25 of them have a Republican governor and 25 of them have a Democratic governor. As of April the 27th, which is three days ago, there were 10,368 deaths in red states and 39,679 deaths in blue states. So if you live in a democratically controlled state, you're almost four times as likely to die as um, if you live in a red state. Now, <laughs> no one's claiming that you die because you're a Democrat, um, but it has all sorts of political consequences. So let me start with some Lorentz curves, which are very familiar to everyone. Um, this, uh, I, this Senate power living is a terrible, um, a terrible um, label here. But along the bottom, you've got the cumulative percentage of population. And on the y-axis, you have the fraction of the Senate votes that are controlled by that fraction of the population. And because the Senate has two members for every state, the least populated states do much better than the well-populated states. So in fact, um, New York, California, Florida, and California, I'm sorry, New York, Texas, California, and Florida have about a third of the US population between them, but they only have 8% of the votes in the Senate. So that's what you're looking at here, a lot of inequality associated with political representation. 
And that matters right now. So if instead of looking at the people who are alive, let's look at the people who are dead and look at the Lorenz curve for them, it's even more extreme. So this is the Lorenz curve for the Senate power dead. So you've got about 5% um, of votes for about 60% of the people who die. Um, the House is a little bit better um, because it's selected proportional to population and it's much closer um, to the green line. So if you like Gini coefficients, um, the Gini for the Senate votes of the living is 0.75, which would typically be regarded as an extraordinarily high Gini. The Gini for Senate votes among the dead is 0.88 and House votes among the dead is 0.78. And that's because the deaths are concentrated in a few places, particularly about 50 miles north of here, um, now spilling over into New Jersey, which has more deaths now than New York for the last couple of days. Well, why does this matter? It matters because we've now got to a point where the rhetoric in the Senate is no more bailouts for blue states. Um, we're not gonna give any more money to these blue states. And it's like, okay, no more bailouts for people who've died. So the lack of empathy across political lines appears to actually extend to the COVID deaths themselves. What's more is the relief bills as usual have large corporate tax cuts. Um, the lobbyists are not at all cowed by the presence of an epidemic that's killing large numbers of people. If it spreads, and that's the huge question, you know, is this in the end gonna infect three quarters of the American population as some epidemiologists think? Then it may be that once it gets to the Republican strongholds, um, then it'll be really bad. Uh, the, the people who live there, the Trump voters, the Republicans, they're older, they're more wet, met, more likely to be male. There's worse health, worse health care in those areas where they live. Um, and if the virus spreads widely, all these political calculations will change and you will see the Senate becoming um, much more sympathetic um, towards these people. Um, just to give you an example, where I'm sitting in New Jersey, New Jersey reported 320 COVID deaths yesterday in Montana, where we like to spend the summer and where we hope to spend August, there were zero deaths yesterday. That doesn't mean there's no COVID in Montana, it's there, but the number of deaths varies. Let me say something about racial and ethnic inequalities, which I know has been an issue in Britain um, too. Um, there are higher COVID-19 mortality rates among Blacks and Hispanics. Um, the proportional theory doesn't really work here because the baseline mortality rates for Blacks are higher than for Whites, which is consistent, but the baseline mortality rates for Hispanic is lower than for Whites, which is not consistent. Now, I'll show you a slide in a minute, but the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, argues that COVID-19 inequalities are largely spatial, which is just what I've been talking about in the political context, and that many whites live in areas without COVID-19. So, you know, Montana is full of white people. There's very few or no COVID-19 deaths there. And so that's why the whites do better than the blacks. And New York City's where most of the deaths have been as a racial ethnic composition that's very different from America as a whole. Housing and density are likely to be important as well as occupation and the things I talked about already about working in healthcare. Native Americans appear to have been very badly hit. So I got, we don't really have good data on this, but there's very convincing stories about the Navajo um, with very crowded living conditions and often um, no running water, so you can't even wash hands. Here's the number. So the percentage of COVID, this is as of April 22nd, the percentage of COVID deaths, 52% non-Hispanic whites, 21% non-Hispanic blacks, and 16.5% Hispanics. The percentage of population of these three groups you can see in the next slide, and you can see that the percentage of white deaths is below its population percentage and the percentage of black deaths is um, close to double that of its population percentage. And there's been a lot of, a lot of agonizing and talk about this. Um, the CDC though, I have not, these are not my calculations, these are the CDC's calculation. Um, what they did was they went through county by county in the US and reweighted the population so that each county got a weight depending on how many COVID deaths have been there. So if there's no COVID deaths there, 
that county doesn't count. And when you reweight that way, you can see that whites are actually doing worse than um, blacks. Um, there's 52.1 um, versus 40, 21.2 versus 18. Um, so what that tells you is not that bad things are not happening to African Americans. What it tells you is that this is a largely spatial phenomenon. And it probably does say that hospitals are not treating blacks worse than whites. It, it seems to rule that out. But what it doesn't rule out is segregation and density and poor housing conditions, which have always been an issue. Let me finish by talking about very speculative things about the long run, <clears throat> where there are many, many forces and we can all wave our hands around. Um, it's possible that globalization will slow. It's already been slowing, it slows some more. It might be possible that some reshoring of jobs as globalization shows further, but there's always automation, which has actually been much more important for working people anyway. There's a, you know, I'd say a large permanent move. Obviously, it's, it's going to be less than what we see right now, but it's hard to believe that e commerce, e communication, e socializing, e meetings, and so on will not go ahead and not go back to the level of before. I was at the National Academy of Sciences meeting over the weekend. Everybody over and over and over again said this was the best ever meeting. There were more people there. The voting was much more credible. All sorts of problems they worried about, about not getting people to come to meetings were solved overnight by using Zoom. Um, all of this favors the more educated and points to more automation because the people who are going to be making these things think life is going to be wonderful. US healthcare is likely to change. Maybe not if it comes out of this crisis as having seen it perform really well, the hero scenario. Um, it will change if it's seen as a villain. And it's already being changed. New Jersey has decided that foreign doctors can work here. New York has consolidated its hospitals. Um, the cost of healthcare, which is astronomical in the US, twice as much as anywhere else in the world, essentially works like a poll tax taking a wrecking ball to low wage labor markets. And that has been one of the big forces making life work worse for people without a BA in the US. And we can hope that that might change. Um, final slide. Um, just, I'm hoping that some of the institutions that support inequality in the face, support equality in the face of risk um, might actually be enhanced by this pandemic. So there might be a greater recognition that public institutions are required to manage risk, that markets and globalization have high returns, but high risk. You can turn everything over to the market, but then when things fall apart, you're in a mess. Now in the United States, a huge amount of our social safety net is actually privately provided through firms, much more so than in any other rich country. That turns out when the firms close or this pandemic, it's a terrible idea. So we need to be adjusting our sort of social portfolio away from risk and towards accepting lower income. Also a greater recognition in the United States, this has always been a terrible thing. It's gotten worse in recent years, that public goods are really important. People, especially people on the right, think that public goods are just rich people paying for poor people, lazy people to get things that they're not entitled to. And we should realize these public goods are important in an emergency. There's probably some restoration of social capital. I mean, you've seen that in Britain. Um, Bob Putnam has written a new book in which he talks about we versus I, and we may get more of a restoration of we instead of I. This Queen's speech a week or two ago invoking World War II, that wonderfully moving thing when she said, the first time I talked to you 80 years ago, I was with you then and I'm with you now. That construction of social capital seems to me very likely. It's not so likely here, given our leadership. Um, there might be some restoration of trust in science, which has been under great attack in America. Um, Tony Fauci, this 79-year-old, hitherto fairly obscure National Institutes of Health official, is now the most trusted man in America. But just a note, caution, beware of the tyranny of experts. The experts always need to be democratically challenged. And there's a very interesting dichotomy here between the US at one poll where you know the doctors are 
speak, but are only occasionally listened to. And Sweden at the other side where their institutions are set up so that the politics cannot interfere with the chief public health officer who's taken a line which is very different from what is happening in other countries and where it might succeed, but it's much too early to tell. But right now the deaths in Sweden look really bad. So I will stop there. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Angus, uh, for both a, a thought-provoking and very interesting talk and uh, personally for sticking to time. Uh, so now uh, Richard Blundell will present for something like the same amount of time and we'll have a little bit at the end for questions. Hey, thank you. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Thanks, uh, Angus. Uh, let me see. Is that working, Rachel? See my slides, I hope. Um, yes, it's working. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Angus. Um, as you see, that what I've put together here is based on uh, some recent joint work. Um, there's a huge amount of work going on on this, and I should add that it's quite preliminary, and we're just thinking it through, really. This is joint work with Monica and uh, Robert and Shaoway, who uh, Angus has already mentioned. Uh, as many of you will know, we're uh, partway through uh, a long-term review of inequality uh, and Angus is the chair, uh, looking at the causes, consequences, drivers, and what have you of inequality. And when this pandemic first hit, we were in our editorial meeting and we, uh, we worried that inequality now may be driven down the agenda. Um, but of course, um, let me just see if I can get that to go. But far from pushing inequality down the agenda, the pandemic has reinforced, I think, the need to deal with the challenges posed by inequality. And we've already seen uh, some of that discussion in what Angus have said. I'm gonna focus uh, a little bit more detail on the UK and probably far too much material. Uh, one point uh, that I want to make here is that the pandemics highlighted existing inequalities. Um, those things that were already there that have come into the fore and are I'll give you a little bit of a run through those inequalities in income, in wealth, in work, in health, in education, in housing, in savings, by ethnicity, age, all important. At the same time, it's kind of opened up new fissures along dimensions that we previously thought were less significant. Working at home being an obvious one, housing, green space, all those issues. There's, I think, a new emphasis on building a fairer society, at least I hope there is. But of course, with the challenge of doing so while facing unprecedented levels of peacetime debt. What I want to do then, a little bit uh, along the lines as, um, that, that Angus uh, laid out, is think very briefly where we stand in the UK in terms of inequality before the pandemic hit. I call that BC. <laughs> uh, what's happened, you know, that, that's more as the pre existing structures, as Angus uh, put it. Um, I want to look at what's happened during lockdown, uh, the impact of behaviors and policy responses, so kind of during COVID, DC. And then briefly think about coming out of lockdown and rebuilding the economy, the, the longer term uh, side of this. If you look at um, uh, earnings and income inequality, we've had a decade of stagnation in median earnings, not quite as dramatic as in the US, but still uh, quite dramatic. In fact, if you go back to the mid 90s, and just do a comparison, household earnings inequality in the UK has risen since that time. But much of it in terms of household income, net income after taxes, benefits and transfers has been offset by increases in the generosity, particularly of in-work benefits, increased employment and increased number of two-earner couples. At the same time, benefit cuts have eroded the safety net. And I think one thing we're all aware of is that the pandemic is really testing the, the safety net across many countries right now. It's weakened. What happened before was the weakening of the link between people's actual needs and what the system would cover. For example, the value of out of work benefits has fallen relative to earnings since the 70s. Benefits were frozen in cash terms for four years, 
There's a benefit cap, the two child limit, changes in housing benefit for private sector rents, and the so-called bedroom tax. They all decoupled the relationship between benefits and actual needs. Added to that, there's a large fraction, as I'll show you, of households who have low savings and high, high debt, especially among, but not limited to poorer, younger households, a key group, in fact, as we'll see. The loss of work and earnings from the pandemic has been uh, remarkable, of course. The resulting lockdown has brought the effectiveness of the safety net into sharp focus. We've had a hunt, we had 1.8 million new claims in the first four weeks after social distancing. So many, many more different people now are becoming, um, becoming aware and being part of the welfare system. And this must, I think, have impacts. If you look at just the structure of household incomes, you can see the way in work benefits have really propped up the growth of income over this last 25 years um, in the UK. You can see the light green line being, if that wasn't there, then we'd have had a much, much lower growth at the bottom. And this reflects the reliance on in work benefits, which of course, with a big hit uh, to employment, um, is really stretched. If you look at what's happened in the system um, and look at here, we've got some measures of the impact of tax and benefit reforms just up to just before uh, the pandemic uh, split by income decile. And you can see the dark line is working age families with children and the poorest of those have really been affected by the reforms. And that's a key pre-existing structure. Let me turn to the last one savings that green line is the proportion of households by income decile who are unable to manage a month if they lost their source of income much higher of course quite remarkably high in a way among the low income group and this puts into perspective where we stood as we come into the lockdown and um, uh, what we see in the lockdown is it's highlighted existing inequalities, inequalities across types of workers, those who can work at home, those who are key workers, those who need to commute on public transport, those in shutdown industries, inequalities across families, those who have children, those who are single parents, those who don't have available childcare, inequalities in resources, those who have savings, those who have houses, the new thing, those with gardens or near open spaces. And of course, the impact on wealth, those who rely on, on a more private, personal, individual insurance rather than a more social insurance. Um, the move to DC with a 20% fall in uh, the stock market, there's really big impact on those future pension and those pensioners and a cut in wealth, maybe uh, we won't need a wealth tax to reduce the wealth of the middle class, this would do it. Health inequalities, those who have long-term health conditions, those that care for the vulnerable, that's particularly acute and a particularly important consideration by ethnic group in the UK. And if I get a chance, I'll mention some recent work on that. And then finally, but far from least, is the education inequalities, parenting inequalities, the exacerbation probably of intergenerational inequalities. We know the importance now of those who have access to online education, those who have educated parents, those indeed who are leaving school or graduating this year. These have highlighted many things, but the declining position of the young and the poor and the erosion of generosity in the safety net um, for those without, particularly for those without employment. As my colleague Paul Johnson put it, we might all be in this together, but we're certainly not all in it equally. There's some great work going on describing what's happening. This is work from Abby Adams, Theodor Bruneva and, uh, and their colleagues looking at uh, the types of workers who've been lost their jobs, furlonged, currently working, just to point two things here. Obviously, we know there are major differences here, for example, between those involved in uh, accommodation and food services. A lot of loss, loss of job, 
and even more furloughing versus those in public administration defense. What we've done is look at a little bit more detail on that. You can see nearly a third of employees age 25 or less are in sectors currently shut down in the UK. And look at the difference between men and women. For the younger group, it's women that are more likely to be in shutdown sectors. And this gender difference and age difference is gonna be something we see clearly through these charts. If we look at a little bit more detail at this, looks complicated, but it really isn't. It's really showing that workers in lockdown sectors are lower paid and less likely to be able to work from home. You can see the active versus sectors in lockdown and look at that little bit in the bottom left-hand corner of the right-hand chart there. You can see those with average gross, lower gross weekly pay are much less likely to be able to, to take their work to home. They're the sectors in lockdown are the lower uh, pays and less likely to work at home. And this is a kind of key difference that we really didn't think of uh, before the pandemic. If you look at family status, another thing becomes clear, and perhaps we knew this, is that lone parents, that's the group on the right, proportion working in lockdown sector, much more likely to be lone parents, and of course, more likely to be women. And then finally, almost taking up uh, a point of Angus's here, medical vulnerability is very related, in fact, now to household income decile. And we've known this, many people work on this. But if you just look at this little plot that's been put together here, um, which takes the share of medical, those medically vulnerable uh, by household income, you can see it's much more likely, certainly those with indeed with um, those that might suffer from social isolation with long-standing mental health conditions much more concentrated in the lower income deciles. So inequalities of all kinds here have both been exacerbated and new ones highlighted. An old point but an important one here is that of course those that are now more hit as it were by um, the lockdown spend a larger amount of their share of their income on what we might call comedic consumptions, things you can't change very much. They're really squeezed. If they had any savings, which we've seen, they probably don't, uh, they would be using those, but they have very little excess income. They're really in a tight position. You take the richest fifth, in fact, they're the ones who are almost forced to save. And it's an interesting comparison there and I may come back to that. But think about policy responses uh, during the lockdown. Um, we've had kind of three types of policy responses, at least as far as individuals and workers concerned in the way I'm thinking of this. You can think of furloughing. Furloughing's a, a kind of key policy and a pretty good one, actually. It, it puts a value on the work of firm match. And uh, in fact, the whole pandemic, I think, has given a slightly bigger emphasis on the role of workplace, on the role of a firm, rather than purely the individual here. But it has some downsides, and these are gonna become more important as we come out of, for, out of lockdown. It discourages part-time work, because obviously if you're furloughed, you have to not work for the current company, versus schemes that we might hopefully move perhaps in these directions as we come out of furlough, short-term time schemes, which allow part-time work. In fact, um, this kind of furloughing dis discourages part-time work in the, back in the companies. And it may also discourage taking up work in critical sectors, partly income effects, you've got your income from the furlough, but perhaps more importantly, a rather shone a light on exclusivity contracts where if you are furloughed, um, it turns out your contract doesn't allow you to work for any other firm. It also may discourage firms' innovation to encourage working from home. So I think all of these things really uh, are focusing on these various new inequalities that we've looked at and are going to become key as we think of, uh, of relaxing these reforms. Support for the self-employed, this is a growing group in the UK. 
what we call solo self-employed are really a key group. That is self-employed who um, work for themselves. They have no other uh, employees. And that's been the group, by the way, that's grown quite strongly. And for some of this group, of course, there's been uh, considerable help. In fact, in some ways, uh, the support self-employed has been even more generous uh, than the uh, than the following system. But a growing, but it's generous, but many have been left out. A, a key example is the newly self-employed or those with less than 50% of their earnings from self-employment. And we have to think about that. Adjustments to the safety net. This is a kind of key one, really. We've realized that we did move away from the link between needs and the, income, the support you might get, especially if you're not working. And three obvious responses here that have been implemented and been particularly difficult, I think, to reverse. An increase in the basic amounts in universal credit and work, uh, work in tax credit. A realignment of housing benefit with local rents, which have been kind of full, coming away from each other over the last uh, few years, importantly, and not now covering the typical rent someone would pay. Sick pay re relaxed so that you had immediate access to sick pay. The UK safety net then, particularly after the last year of these changes, reforms and cuts, has been challenged by the falling earnings and employment across the distribution. And these uh, cuts have further decoupled this support from actual costs, looking even less like social insurance. And I think one of the key things that will come out of this is a rethinking of social insurance and a rethinking of the way um, we uh, insure individuals and society. Coming out of lockdown, I think it's key, just running through some ideas here, it's kind of key that the process of opening up should be mindful of inequalities. Reducing furloughing, allowing for part-time work and work in other firms, and particularly which type of works, workers we're, we're looking at here. The opening of schools impacts by family type and ethnicity. Relaxing of social distancing, obviously a key around to this is the way we roll out our testing capacity. And as I pointed out just now, this reversing of the, of the way of the temporary changes to the self safety net, to sick pay, housing benefit, universal credit, are we going to reverse these? And how should we think about them? Is it the case that we should be rethinking the way the safety net works? There's a key role in reopening supply chains here. And I think this places perhaps a more emphasis on the coordination of policies across countries. And in a sense, the politics of the last few years has moved away rather depressingly in some ways from the value in coordination of policy across countries. And yet we know supply chains are important. And unless we have some coordination of their opening up, then we'll have a much, much more chaotic end to the uh, lockdown period. Changes in the structure of industry and trade and offshoring, something I think that Angus mentioned. But what we've seen is already investors kind of figuring out that the big, large surviving firms are going to do pretty well, potentially, out of the uh, coming out of lockdown. And uh, we need to think about how to regulate the market power of those large surviving firms and so that we do get innovation and we don't uh, succumb to their increased market power. And then perhaps finally in this coming out of lockdown, just thinking about how to repair the lost education investments and the likely longer term impacts of graduating in lockdown. A few final thoughts, I think. Um, yeah, <laughs> Rachel, I'm almost on time. Uh, in the longer run, uh, the after coronavirus period, financing the deficit and debt and fair taxation, a point a number have made, but I think there is this move or could be this move. As Angus pointed out, this is very much depending on how the political economy of the pandemic uh, evolves. A move to the new social contract, more emphasis on social insurance rather than just simple individual insurance. Perhaps a new beverage report 
as my uh, colleague on the on the review panel, Tim Besley, likes to put it, uh, the importance of fiscal capacity as well as uh, social and um, and state capacity, but just thinking about enhancing fiscal capacity and the role and the importance in trust in government. How are we going to uh, think about that? What about a wealth tax? Should we be using the usual uh, the the usual uh, 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 fiscal uh, uh, fiscal instruments, VAT, in, income tax, things we've typically stayed away from recently, and all this at a time of increased populism, which um, which in a sense goes against these uh, simple ideas. Moving to thinking about a just system of rewards, perhaps intergenerational risk redistribution. We've already seen it's the young and the poor, and typically women, in fact who um, are suffering or taking the, some of the biggest hits from this, uh, from the upshot of the lockdown and lockdown policies. The already squeezed young working age, um, we have to worry about intergenerational redistribution here. It just highlights the issues that have been uh, focused on recently, both in the institutional intergenerational redistribution or distribution of wealth, but also of the impact and payment for climate change. As I said, I think we're moving to a new emphasis on social insurance, which by the way has all but disappeared in the UK, rather than simple redistribution. More people, many more people, will have experienced welfare state help. Will this change attitudes? We might think, and Angus made this point, that um, this will enhance the bargaining power, the importance, our view, of how the wages of healthcare workers and other key workers should uh, look. These are more likely to be female, are more somewhat low paid, and actually they've done relatively poorly in recent years. But against that, and we saw that in the, in the talk we just heard, there's an increase in demand for e-commerce and IT. These are all things that require education and skills. So will the market play out here and in fact increase these inequalities? between those with skills and education and those who have not? Or will we, will we reach a new contract, social contract in the way uh, rewards are given? Then finally, in thinking about that, the changes in preferences and abilities and technology for working from home, much of which, as Angus mentioned, is gonna help those who are rather better off currently. So that's the way I thought about it and uh, not much time, a lot of great work going on. And as I said, far from pushing equality down the agenda, the pandemic has really, I think, reinforced the need to deal with the challenges posed by inequality. So as I said, highlighting existing inequalities, at the same time, opening up new fissures and perhaps a new emphasis on building a fairer society. Um, but of course, with the challenge of doing this, while facing unprecedented levels of debt. So that's it, Rachel and Angus, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much, Richard, and thank you to keeping to time there. Um, Angus, maybe you'll both join now because I have a couple of questions. Um, so the first question is, um, maybe you can stop showing your screen, Richard. Oh, yeah. um, the first question is, um, do either of the speakers have anything to say about intergeneration inequalities in a life cycle as opposed to a cross-sectional sense? So how might we attempt to quantify how much this pandemic will have disadvantaged younger and future generations compared to those currently middle-aged and older? Yeah, I think, um, you know, yeah, I think you're going to have a talk in this series on education which is where I would focus most on answering that question. Um, you know, I have three grandchildren who are having a wonderful time on Zoom and who are getting all their classes and prospering and learning up a storm. Um, but uh, um, from what I hear, um, that's not true of all kids. And for kids with behavioral problems, kids where there's not much education going on at home, um, then their presence in the school seems like seriously required. There's also enormous inequities in the US at least on internet access. 
And a lot of rural kids don't have any internet access at all. They don't even have a cell phone that works. So those, and I've heard people talking about, you know, use this crisis to get a national broadband plan. So we actually make sure that, and that would be a form of insurance for kids. But I still think you're gonna to have to get teachers back in the school. I mean, I was talking to a biology teacher yesterday who was teaching remotely and who was putting a bag of frozen squid on her doorstep for her kids to come and collect so they could do experiments at home. And of course, only about half the kids in our class came and collected the frozen squid. And I said, are they all the kids who are gonna succeed anyway? And she said, most of them were, but there was a couple I've never dreamed of in a million years would come and get a frozen squid from my front doorstep. Right? So there will be inequalities of that sort. And if people lose out on that education, that's going to have intergenerational effects forever. Yeah, I just to echo that in the UK, uh, there are the pre-existing inequalities, you know, whether we like it or not, we know that the amount of times that parents spend reading with younger children differs across the income distribution and uh, the amount of, as, as you said, the, the amount of space that people have to learn at home and the ability to access online education has all been shown to be quite different. And I think that's really been highlighted now. Okay, so a second question is, um, you both uh, painted a very clear picture about the, in a, the unequal effects of this, um, of this pandemic. Um, and I think probably gave a rather optimistic view of how policy might be able to tackle it. Of course, we're going to be in also in a fiscally very tight situation. And so the traditional safety net is going to be put under quite a lot of pressure, already has been under a lot of pressure. Um, and so I guess just I wondered what your reflections are. I know in the Deaton Review, you've, um, it, you've, you've uh, shown that there's also inequalities in political participation. And so given what we've seen currently in the rise of populist governments, um, what do you think we need to do to ensure that we go down that good path from a policy point of view, as opposed to what might be more social unrest, more, uh, you know, the, the less optimistic view of how we can deal with these inequalities going forward. Richard. Okay, I'll have a shot. Um, the great question. Um, I'm always a little more optimistic than uh, perhaps uh, reality suggests. So apologies for that or no apologies for that. Um, I think the points that Angus made are, are brilliant on the geography of the political discourse and also by ethnic groups, I would say. So what's the political voice of the groups that are now being disadvantaged and how will that play out in the setting of um, the, you know, the, the longer term policies, both in terms of public good investment and in the, and the uh, and investments in social insurance against this huge deficit that is going to have to be paid off. The geography is quite interesting in the UK. We're only just beginning to understand the way it's playing out, but it, it clearly is different between London and the cities and elsewhere. And we know the politics of, uh, is also different across those. And I think the, the mapping between the political, uh, where the, the political side and the, uh, and the impacts of the pandemic is key here. I don't think they're quite as stark as in the US though, because clearly the, the London has been and the cities have been a very important, uh, uh, had a, a very important uh, downside, if you want, for people there, even though the more vulnerable live outside, in fact, but that's where the pandemic's hit. And, of, uh, and so I think there will be a, a action there on the pandemic. I'd just bring the ethnic side up, but it's really key here. There's no question there's a disproportionate a really worrying disproportionately high uh, number of hospital deaths among ethnic and, uh, and racial non-white British population. And we're only just beginning to understand that. And whether that can somehow get through into the political debate or whether it gets um, completely uh, covered uh, is very important. Yeah, just to say, I'm, I'm surprised you took what I said as optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> I think to see an optimistic outcome in the US, you really, prayer is probably as good an outcome, as good a tool as any. Um, just because um, 
you know, if what some epidemiologists say is true, which is that before this is under control, 70% of the US population are going to get it. Well, if 70% are infected, even with very low infection fatality rates, we've got a lot of dying still to do. Um, I'm hoping that may not be true um, and that we've done most of the dying and that would be wonderful if it were true. But the politics is so poisonous here and there's so little leadership from the top. Now, some of that is by design that the governors are actually in charge of public health. And some of the governors, most notably Andrew Cuomo in New York, has done a very good job of bringing people together and giving leadership and you know, has become much loved, not just by New Yorkers, but by other people too. Not all the governors have been in that position, but you know, if you're a governor in Montana and yesterday there were zero deaths, right? But half your businesses are shut down. And the biggest reduction in GDP, I just heard this yesterday, so I couldn't put it in my slides, has come from the healthcare sector, right? <laughs> the, the huge, because hospitals are closing, doctors are being fired, nurses are being sent home. And that's happening because the hospitals work on elective surgeries or elective procedures, you know, and those have been stopped. And in a lot of the country, that's, there's no COVID, but there are now no elective procedures either. So these hospitals are redundant. And because we don't have a national health service, the nurses who would love to work in New York or New Jersey can't do that without losing their own health insurance or their own wages and so on. So we really have a seriously messed up system. But to come back to the politics, in the absence of leadership from the center, the governors have actually formed three groups of states. So they're reshaping the United States and working together, uh, mostly Democratic governors in the East and in the West, and a few in the middle who are getting together and trying to coordinate the plans, which you have to do because you don't want people moving backwards and forwards, you know, infected people moving backwards and forwards between states. And that's something you would have thought that the center should be doing but the center really is not doing that here. So, so one can hope that this big spread doesn't happen and that you know, these states that have not really done very much will not suffer very much. If it moves and it really does expand to the whole population, then I think there's terrible trouble ahead. Something we haven't talked about and you had a talk last week is the inequalities between rich countries and poor countries. Yeah. And, this inequality in the US between the places that don't have it yet, but are frightened of getting it, um, applies to a lot of Africa, a lot of India, where the number of deaths have been very, very small so far, but where there are draconian measures that are hurting the economy and very few deaths, but the fear of many, many deaths. And so no one really knows how to sort that out. It's an example of extreme uncertainty and policymaking on life and death matters in the face of extreme uncertainty. Yeah. Okay, you're right. Not quite so optimistic as I said. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's um, all we have time for. We had some other questions, but I'll attempt to forward those on to the right people uh, who, who might be able to help answer them. I just want to thank you very much, both of you. That was very thought provoking and, uh, and great. So thanks a lot. A virtual clap. Thank you.